My name is Eris and God is in my corner. And my name is Emmanuel and God is in my corner. My name is Maria and God is in my corner. My name is Matthew and God is in my corner. My name is Will and God is in my corner. Welcome to our Family Ministries Takeover. Well, wow. <laughs> Makes you feel really powerful when your voice comes out that loud. Um, uh, as it said, welcome to our Family Ministries uh, Takeover. If uh, you've never met me, my name is uh, Brandon. I'm the youth pastor here at All Nations Church. Uh, and so I uh, kind of work with those from grade 7 uh, to grade 12. Uh, my wife, who you'll meet a little later, her name is uh, Julia. She handles our kids' ministry. So today, um, we kind of decided to take over the service a little bit for you, give you a little bit of insight into what's happening um, with the next generation of this church. And, and I got to tell you, um, from what we're going to see today, uh, that the next generation of this church is alive and thriving. It is uh, so encouraging to see um, as the youth pastor. And so uh, to kind of give you a little bit of, of a roadmap for today, it will not be uh, your standard sermon. Um, it, I've asked, uh, the kids are actually going uh, to be kind of reading our scriptures for us today. Um, I forced some of our young adults to act out uh, the story. Um, <laughs> And some of them I don't actually think realize that it's being played for everyone, um, but they're about to find out. Uh, and then we also have uh, some testimonies from our very own uh, youth, kind of talking about how God has worked in their life. So it's, it's really exciting, uh, but it's also a little bit different than what we're used to here at All Nations Church. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about David and Goliath, one of the best known uh, stories probably in the Bible. Um, most of you could probably give me a pretty good rundown of what the story entails. So I have a question for you. Have you ever faced something impossible in your life? Have you ever faced something that seemed like you would never be able to get through it? You know, when I got married, uh, as, as you probably heard from me a few months ago, um, I talked about... Uh, a chair that my wife owned. Does anyone remember this? Okay, so, um, so it felt like an impossibility for me that we were ever going to get rid of this stupid chair. And I have great news to report to you. <laughs> this is us at, at the dump um, <laughs> throwing, out, uh, throwing out Julia's chair. She's not super happy about it. Uh, we actually bought brand new ones from Ikea, so she's happy now, but... Um, at the time, she wasn't super happy, but um, in our life, sometimes we face uh, things that seem significantly uh, more impossible, things that are, are serious um, and things that, that we just can't seem to get over, whether that or not that's an unexpected job change, a breakdown in our relationship to needing to move countries and failing to meet a personal goal. There are things that we hit that we just don't know how um, we're going to find that way forward. And as we look uh, at David today, we see this impossibility uh, in his life, Goliath, the towering giant that threatened his country, his family, and himself. And yet, his response to this threat, to this impossibility, is not one of fear or, or freezing, but instead a radically different approach. So as we look at, at 1 Samuel 17, we want to get a little situated in our story. So we pick up uh, in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephstemim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Eli and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites in another with the valley between them. So there they are at the Valley of Elah, a location still standing to this day. But while there may have been uh, some good games of, of chess or, or dodgeball going on, uh, there wasn't actually a battle taking place. The two armies were just kind of staring at each other from across. Uh, one was on one hill, one was on another, and they were just kind of waiting 
for something to happen. You know, we know that uh, the Israelites probably had a better army. Just three chapters ago, we actually read uh, them beating the Philistines in in battle. So we know that uh, likely the Israelites are better, but for some reason, they're not actually battling. So as we read on, we see the Philistines actually deciding to do something about it. Goliath was a big giant who hates everyone who supports Jesus and they, he's a really bad person. Um, he's big, scary. Who's scary? A champion named Goliath was from Gath. He came out of the Philistines' camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet and on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 ski kills. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His bare shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Uh, Yeah, I got to give, I don't think he's here today. I think he's at Little Kickers. But I got to give a special shout out to Matthew. He uh, is our narrator for today. He was... He was very convinced he would do a great job, and so I'm so glad that, uh, that he did that for us. But uh, Goliath was a towering man. Uh, somewhere, obviously, I don't know if many of you measure yourself in cubits and spans anymore, uh, but for those of us who don't, um, that's between about eight and a half and nine and a half feet. Now, this wouldn't have been unusual for the time. Plenty of ancient writers, um, both Jewish and non-Jewish, recorded... Um, people being this tall. So it's not something uh, crazy. He had tons of armor and weapons, probably weighing up uh, to 200 pounds. And this was a guy you did not want to mess with. And Goliath issues this bold challenge to the army of Israel. Uh, The word champion really comes from the Hebrew word meaning a middleman, the man between two. So the idea is that this was the man who the men who stood between the two armies and kind of fought it out as representatives of their army. Goliath wants to fight Israel's very best and calls out for someone to fight him. But the Israelite response is shocking. And the Philistines and the Israelites, all the Israelites were scared to fight Goliath. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. The Philistines came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. So we observed earlier that Israel probably had a superior force. So why didn't they just launch a defensive to defeat the enemy? They didn't attack because they decided to let the enemy dictate the terms of engagement. When in war, if you decide the timing, the location, the weapons, etc., it gives you a pretty good advantage. Assuming the Philistines were indeed weaker, it would make good sense for them to have two individuals representing the two armies, especially since they had Goliath, who was such a great warrior. The most obvious application of the strategy of dictating the terms of engagement is found in the surprise attack. Right? The timing of your, of your attack and your tactics are carefully planned, right? where the enemy is caught completely unawares to your plan. Uh, 1 John 4.4 4 states that the greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. God is on our side. Therefore, like Israel, we have the more powerful force. Yet, we sometimes give our enemy Satan an advantage by allowing him to dictate the terms of engagement. 
Let's listen to a few testimonies from some of our youth and young adults. Hi, my name is Julia and I'd just like to share some of my story with you. I grew up in a Christian household. My dad grew up in a Christian household and my mom became a Christian in her late teens. And we went to church a lot. Not always, my dad was a shift worker and we couldn't always make it if he was working. But when he wasn't, we went to church. In my early years, there were a couple of different churches as we moved around. But as I started in middle school age uh, ministries, we settled with one church and I stayed there until my early 20s. When I left Sunday morning middle school ministry and started on Sunday night high school ministry, I was given the opportunity to either serve in a ministry somewhere or sit in grown up church with my parents. And yeah, grown up church is great, but the opportunity to serve in a nursery was a lot better sounding to me. Leaving high school, I started college and uh, I wanted to become a photographer and travel the world and document people's stories and uh, do some humanitarian work, things like that. And I ran out of money after my first year um, and I wasn't really sure how I was gonna achieve the things I wanted and how I was gonna get where I wanted to go. And I had the opportunity to take an internship at my church that I'd grown up in and uh, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing, but really hard because I had to do a lot of growing and a lot of learning and uh, looking back on it, it, it really set the foundation for where I am today. And uh, actually looking back on everything that God has had me done, even if I chose it, even if I didn't choose it, wanted to, didn't want to, whatever it was, it was very obvious that God wanted me to learn something, meet someone, do something, and uh, that he was working in my life, whether or not it was what I wanted. My faith is very important to me and it has been important to me my whole life. My parents instilled that in me. And uh, when I was in my teens, I took hold of that, started serving, started praying, reading my Bible and was baptized. And then into my teens, as I've moved around, I've moved to different churches, with different groups, uh, always making sure I can either serve somewhere or be a part of something so that, uh, so that I'm growing in my faith and uh, growing with other Christians. That's very important to me. And uh, it's fun to look back on where I've been and what I've done and be like, huh, I don't know if I picked to do that. That one might've been God. And uh, it, was, it was the best. It was the best decision. Some of it, I look back on it and I'm like, wow, that hurt, that sucked. But it was the best because God used it to grow and change me. And uh, yeah, God's always been in my corner and uh, it's really exciting to me. So I, when I was six years old, like six, like seven or, 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 or ten or something. So like, I was like walking from home to my my school. It was like it was like at least like ten minutes walk, and like I saw like a dog, like a kitten, like in a street. It was bleeding, and like he doesn't have any food. He was starving or something, and I went to save it, and then I saw a car, a car, like a car like coming close. And I almost died actually, but apparently the car stopped and oh, the car did hit me. The, the, the car hit me, yeah. The car hit me, but it didn't hit me all the way. So I had like almost a broken leg. And yeah, he hurt me because I didn't die. My name is Emanuela, I love for sure. God is with everybody, not in me. Everybody, families, friends, everybody he knows. God loves everybody. No matter how hard you hate yourself or how hard life is, he's always answering your prayers. My name is Shirley and this is my testimony. So um, my family and I used to live in Keswick, Ontario, and my dad actually still worked in Sudbury, so he'd have to drive to Sudbury and then stay there for a week and maybe come down on the weekend and go back and forth and back and forth. So my parents really wanted us to get a house somewhere, just to own a house, but in Sudbury so that we don't, my dad doesn't have to drive back and forth. And my siblings and I were like, yeah, right. But <laughs> my parents said that wherever God leads us, we would go. So we end up finding a house in Sudbury and my parents bought it and we're like, and um, I remember feeling that I was just like, like I was leaving everybody, everything I knew behind, all my friends, everything I was familiar with. 
And it wasn't until we actually moved to Sudbury and God started opening doors and making us feel comfortable that I realized that I hadn't left anything familiar because my, familiar, my familiarity is in God and God is my home. So wherever we go, God is with us. I'm Charlize and God is in my corner. <laughs> Um, what what great test it's always uh, it's always so great to be able to to kind of listen to some of the stories of of the youth that we have um, and really see how, how God has worked uh, in their lives through through everything that they've gone through so as we pick uh, kind of back up in our story of David and Goliath we're finally introduced to the actual story of the uh, the hero of the story uh, David David was a little boy. David was in the woods. David was a shepherd. David is told by his dad, Jesse, to go and deliver food to his brothers. He was still too young to be fighting in the army. But when David got there, he hurt Goliath with his taunts. He wanted to do something, but his brothers told him to go back to his folks. But so wanted to see David, and David tells him, let no one lose hurt on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Now, uh, you may recognize uh, David from all sorts of stories. Um, we hear about him quite a bit. So we want to situate kind of where he is in his life in our minds. So he's actually already been anointed uh, to be king by Samuel, but Saul isn't aware of him. If you remember, Samuel didn't think that David looked like a king. He was young, likely only 15 or 16. But even though he was young, he still wants to go out and fight him. And so when he proposes this to Saul, we see uh, Saul's reaction in verse 33. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. Saul's assessment of this situation was entirely worldly and concluded that David had no chance of victory. When God is left out of the equation, our difficulties appear insurmountable. Now contrast that with David's evaluation of the situation. Um, David, and David wanted to use the God's love to defeat. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Now David reasoned that the same God who enabled him to defeat the lion and the bear would also give him victory over Goliath. That is how we grow in our faith. It's a dynamic process. As we trust in God and, and we see victories in our life from that faith, we begin to have more and more faith in him. He brings us larger tests in our lives so that the cycle repeats itself. That's where David was. God has been preparing him for years for this exact moment. Though Goliath was perhaps the most formidable warrior and had all the worldly defenses, God had increased David's faith so that he could face him with boldness and confidence. David looked at the situation through the eyes of faith, believing that he had the best offense and defense, God by his side. But somebody wanted David to use uh, armor, uh, 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 a sword, but 
but he didn't want it to, and, and he used it God's love. Then he stops. Then so clothed David with his garments, and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. David took them off. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistines. Again, we see this distinction between Saul and David. It's easy in a battle that we take every worldly advantage we can get. We throw on that armor, hedging our, our bets a little, get our biggest weapons ready, and ignore what God is saying. David knew how God had prepared him for this battle, and he fully trusted him. I think this happens in our own life. We face that battle, but still want just a little bit of our own plan. We don't want to trust God fully, so we hold just a little bit back. So if God's plan doesn't work, well, we have something set aside so we're still safe. So David uh, gets his stones, and he approaches Goliath. Let's listen to a few more testimonies. My name is Alexander, and and the, my story is about school. So basically, I have a lot of instances at school where I really need a God and He was there. But I'm going to talk about one very important incident that happened kind within the year school year uh so people who are getting mad at me me and they were bullying me mentally and both physically and i kept on praying for god for it to stop and praying to jesus and eventually it stopped and I kept on praying for God to help me stay calm and not like, oh no, where, oh no, they're going to bully me. And eventually I got really confident and I made my turn my enemies into my friends. Some people I can't show my love to them closely, like friendly, but I love them from afar, and that's my story. I'm Alexander, and God is in my corner. Hey guys, I'm Paxton, and this is my testimony. A few months ago, we were on a drive, we're going on a drive to Alberta, and we had to go to the airport, which is four hours away. So 40 minutes in the drive, a rubber piece on top of our roof ripped off. So we stopped and my dad went to go check it out. And my mom just realized that we didn't have the passports. So going to the airport would make no sense completely. So we had to go turn around and go. Well, before we turned around, there's actually a policeman in the intersection in the highway and he let us pass through the intersection because you're actually not allowed to do that. So as we passed, we went home, we got the airports, th the passports, and this is how, uh, this is something that I could tell you guys that God cares about even the little details. I'm Paxton and God is in my corner. All right, so my name is Parker and I was bullied in school and, you know, I thought Satan and God were, like, equal, like, they just had the same amount of power, and that, like, I didn't really have a strong relationship with God, but, and I had a dream about Satan dragging me into hell, and ever since that dream, I decided to turn my life to God, and ever since I turned my life to him, I just felt, I felt peace, I felt joyful, I felt like an overall better person, you know? I felt confidence, 
anything is possible through Christ. If you believe in him and you have a dream that you want to acquire, it's possible. All through Christ. God is in my corner. Um, I had something I was thinking of saying, but watching that has kind of removed it from my mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's actually so great. We, um, those two boys in particular kind of came to youth um, not really feeling like they belonged anywhere. Um, feeling like no matter where they went, it was uh, that they were going to be hurt and they were going to be bullied. And um, it's been such a pleasure to see them kind of blossom a little bit and, and be able to connect with each other. Uh, they're actually really good friends. Um, and, and just be able to see them kind of take ownership of what Christ says about their life has been uh, just so great for me and for the rest of our leaders uh, to see. So as we, as we kind of conclude our story, I think we all know the end of David and Goliath's story, uh, but let's, uh, let's take a look at this last video. Um, David was the only boy who, who fighted, who was able to defeat Goliath. With God's help, he defeated Goliath. Fight him and throw him off. He, he flowed walk at the ladder. He killed the giant. And he went to go back home. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. And he despised him. He said to David, My dog, that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. Now give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistines, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord says, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with, with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheep. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. David didn't hesitate in fear. He ran to the battle line. Many Christians struggle at this very point. Is God supposed to do it or am I? The answer is yes, both of them. God does it and we do it. Trust in God, rely on him and then get to work and work as hard as you can. Run right at the enemy. That is how the work of God is done. He killed Goliath with a shepherd's sling and a stone. God mentions uh, specifically no sword was in David's hand, emphasizing that he didn't win the battle with the world's weapons. God gave David a huge victory that day because David dared to trust God. And as we look at this battle in a new way, we realize that David was never facing an impossibility because he had God by his side. So where do we go from here? How can we have that faith in God when we're facing those impossibilities, the Goliaths that come up in our lives? The answer is we must have faith 
in the small things. Whether we respond in fear like the entire Israelite army or in faith like David depends on how we have responded to the daily tests of faith. In Luke chapter 16, it tells us that if we're faithful in the little things, we will be faithful in the big. Do you really, really want to pass those big tests of faith when they come? If your answer is yes, then you must be faithful in those little decisions of faith. Here are just a few things that, um, that for which you must say yes to in order to have victory over the occasional Goliaths that he'll bring into your life. Things like spending time in the word and in prayer, being a servant to others, giving generously, even when it feels like there's no possible way, and sharing the good news with everyone who will listen. This list, of course, can be modified. I'm sure you're thinking of your own right now. But you get the idea. If you say no to the Lord on those very basic issues, you can be confident that you'll be defeated when you meet that Goliath. On the other hand, can you imagine the thankfulness and the joy uh, in David's heart when he slayed Goliath? You can experience the same if you're only willing to say yes to the Lord and be faithful in him in the little things. It's not easy, but the Lord commands it, and we must do it. It can be done. So say yes to the Lord today and be just as confident of victory as David was when you face your next Goliath. Let's pray. Dear God, I just uh, I thank you uh, for today. I thank you for each person in this room. And I thank you for the example that we can take from uh, from your word, of times when, when people have faced insurmountable odds, but you have been faithful to them. And God, I pray that, that when we face those tests of faith, whether they're, they're little or whether they're large, God, I pray that you would give us courage, that you would give us strength, so that we can meet uh, that battle with, with faith and courage. And God, I just, I pray for... Um, are the next generation of this church. I pray for uh, the kids, for the youth, for the young adults. I pray that, that you would just be in their lives, that you, would, that you would touch them and that we would just see revival in that next generation, that we would see um, a generation on fire for what you uh, would have them do. We thank you uh, for your son and it's in his holy name that we pray, amen.